We're back, folks. We're back, Danny. Another show. Good to see you, man. Phil, uh, you know, I'm just excited. Just excited to be here. My God, you know, we're coming on this season. All you know, all kinds of things are popping up, and uh, I, I'm anticipating an unbelievable year. Uh, you know? Let's let's just enumerate to everybody about what we're talking about. We're talking about Yellowtail Dan in San Quentin, which is 140 miles below the border, yep. for several months now. Now. It's pushed up to Todo Santos Island, right off Ensenada, and they're catching a few up there around La Jolla. So well, we've got a, that. There's a stringer of them out there. They, get, they were getting them out at the rocks. I mean, you know, quality stuff out there. I mean, there's, there's a lot of good stuff. And we don't, you know what? We're fishermen, right? We take what, hap- we take what comes out naturally, what nature gives us. With whatever they, our hand is dealt, that's what we take. And, you know, over the years, we've tried to predict different things. But, you know, we just really don't know for sure. I mean, yeah, we're looking at cooler water. You're looking at a possibility of some of the long guy, long fin guys. You, we just don't know, to be honest with you. You know, it's conducive for it. So we just keep our fingers crossed. But you know what? A good fisherman, regardless what species out there, you're going to be prepared for it. You know, I mean, I'm sure you have the tackle ready for it. And, then, you know, when, when it comes down, if there's... The yellowtail, you pull your yo-yo stuff. You know, you have a certain amount of you know type of gear that you're implementing for for yellows. You, the tuna, we know what's going on with the tuna. It's already happening, folks. You Man, know, and big fish. It, oh, and it's never stopped. You know, those fish have been here all year. Kim Herbert is in Missouri. He says he can't wait to come out for the five-day trip that we have on the Independence. Danny, give Kim your best shot. We leave next Thursday. Tell him with good weather what you think he's going to you, experience. You're definitely, I imagine they're going to shoot south, as, you know, to get some, you know, get some distance from uh, San Diego and get away from the crowds. But I guarantee you, your first day, you're probably going to be uh, catching bluefin. And I mean, they range. There's some units down there already. You know, these guys are getting a lot of fish from 100 to 200 pounds. Yes. So yes. be prepared. Uh, have your your big knife jigs and you know your your gear for your night fishing but be prepared because they're biting during the day danny we've already gotten an yeah. email from brian who runs the boat and he said guys i want to get out of there by 8 a.m get down here at 5 30 let's get all the check-ins and everything so that tells you he's yeah he's looking to put some distance as well, you just said put some distance on it but you may be fishing that you, know, you may be fishing you know that first day with you know within the first eight ten hours i mean that, you're going to be running over fish, I guarantee it. But, you know, I'm sure he's got his agenda. He knows They know exactly where they want to go. Um, I think you're going to probably get into a bunch of good yellowtail fishing. From what I get, there's a stringer of that stuff that, that goes up and down, so up and down the coast. So, you know, I think you're going to have an unbelievable trip, you know. That sounds good. Let me read yeah. a few more comments. Yeah, that's, that's Matthew important. Tamayo says, Danny, so right on. Such an exciting time. He agrees with you. Oh. This is going to be good. Halibut Man, Mitchell. Good to see you, Mitchell. He says, hola, Freeman Adventures family. Mitchell, Michael Limon is standing right next to me, and he says, hello. Omar says, albacore loading. He's thinking we're going to get albacore this year. And (laughs) Danny, look who is joining us right now. I don't know that he's ever come on the show, but California says, hi, Danny and Phil. This is Billy LeVette, Bud LeVette's son. Of course I know Billy from the time he was a little kid. Tell him hello, man. Billy yeah, and get your behind down here one of these days and come see us. You know, a lot, lot to talk about all the old days. Where know? do you know him from? Tell us a right story Right here, about 22nd him. Street. The Indian was docked right next to the Mustang here, you know. And uh, for years, we were here, right here at 22nd Street Landing, you know. And his sister, Dolores, you know. And, and uh, you know, we were all close. We had uh, L.A. City school trips during the week. Uh, so we all kept busy, and we, we were in touch with everybody for years. So, yeah, Billy, get, get down here one night. and Come on come on on a Thursday night, you know. Give us a heads up, and I'll, I'll bring you on as a guest. There's a lot of... Uh, oh, he'd be a great guest. Yeah, he'd yeah, he been around. He saw it. He was, you know, a pretty young kid, but, you know, a little rascal at times, but who wasn't down here? What know? Did he get his captain's license eventually, or you no? Know, I don't know. You know, Billy, I don't know. You could answer back for me, but... yeah. You know, no, he was he was pretty young even when he was with us back then. So, you know, 
What do you remember about, what year would that have been, if you had to guess? What would you think? I would say the early 80s. Oh, my God. Early 80s. Yeah, I yeah. kind of remember, because I remember 80s. Bud Labatt. Yeah, the mid-80s. Yeah. yeah, on the Indian, yeah. right? Yeah, there was, we had, a, we had a blast down here, you know, there was the, the Hesses, and you name it, the whole, you know, I can't even uh, he didn't begin his, to think, where, yeah. He didn't get his license. I didn't either, Billy, so I decided not to get mine, yeah, too, but... Yeah. Man, yeah, that sounds absolutely fantastic. But we had a lot of good times. Yeah, Appreciate you sure. joining us. We yeah. really, really do. Cue ball says, Danny, and the other guy, oh, yeah, Phil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. thanks, cue ball. <laughs> hey, it's good to see you. As always, man, you are always out there. Shout out, Opson, the only fluorocarbon I trust, says Matthew C. Yeah, you can see that Opson right above Danny's head there. And there thank go. God Danny is not that tall. So we can, <laughs> we can see the option. Yeah, don't block out your ad there here. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's why we put that option thing so low, because Danny sits over there. It's not a problem at all. This bluefin is incredible already this year. Fish to 180 pounds. Guys have been catching the limits here. Recently, it's been slow, but they've been dealing with a lot of wind. You know, Phil, the thing is, like all fish, they don't necessarily bite every day. But, you know, you got to remember, these fish are probably down there, down, down deep. Chewing on squid all winter and ha fattening up. And it probably explains some of the sizes of these things that these guys are initially getting. You know, getting them to 200s, you know. Uh, and we know there's much bigger fish around and they will show it up. Guaranteed, we're going to be, you know, we'll be popping a bunch of them over three this year. So uh, it's amazing. It's just getting, getting all prep folks, get ready for this. Uh, we're going to have a heck of a year. Danny, can you walk us through, the captain tells you to drop to 300 feet. So it's essential that you drop when he tells you number one and you get to that depth. When you hook a fish, when your jig stops sinking, for example, or you get bit on the retrieve, what do you do? Do you just turn the handle as hard as you can? Walk us through that. You just turn the handle. You know, your drag's probably set heavy and you want that drag. If you're not comfortable with it, have the crew member set it for you. But you want it snug because you want that hook in him. You know, so the minute... The minute you're grinding, don't you don't have to swing. There's enough force when that fish puts his head down to drive that the barbs into it. But just keep it on the rail, keep it at a low angle, you're gonna get the most pressure out of it. The biggest mistake I see with a lot of guys is they start getting up high and they think the higher they pull, the higher they pull, the more pressure they're getting. That's absolutely wrong. Your pressure drops off the minute you start going over 90 degrees. And it's almost exponential. So to get the max out of it, you'd be pointing the line straight at the fish. And typically that's what I do even when I'm fighting the fish as much as I can. I keep that rod down on the rail and utilize that. And, and with, with myself, um, I'm doing it because I want to, you know, I want to take advantage of that. Uh, I'm, I'm using a straight graphite rod. So the recovery is much quicker. So all it is is a matter of just keeping up with that thing, you know. And if they can't get, if, if they're kicking, and if you're keeping steady pressure on them and you're not, not doing this where they get their head up and down like this, if you're planing them and they're kicking up and they kick, they're going to be kicking right at you. It's a matter of you keeping your hand on that handle and just keeping up with them. And they'll kick themselves to the boat for the most part, you know. There will be a time if they'll probably put their head down, take a little bit of line, but, you know, um, you can save yourself a lot of trouble by fishing the, the right angles on the boat. You're putting much more pressure on it at that point, and you got you got more control of it. So, you know, it's, it's a win-win deal keeping that rod down low, folks. Danny, um, I got I caught one fish on the Independence last time because I'm shooting video all the time. Right, right. But right. I, you know, I watch yeah. the guy. I watch all these guys, you know, and they're high sticking it, and these fish are beating them up. So I take the rod, I got this fish, and I point my rod at the fish, never even hurt my back, never hurt my arms, never put any stress, and I was really super relaxed, and everybody's like, everybody else is like, oh, you know, and I'm like, just point it, wind it, takes a little line, wind a little more on it, and then it gets up to color, and the deckhand goes to reach. I go, hey, let me lay that out for you real nice, <laughs> laid it out for him, and then he pokes it, and man, it makes such a huge difference, what Absolutely. you're talking about. Absolutely, you know, and particularly if you're using a composite or like in my case, I'm using straight graphite. So, oh, oh, wait, hold on, we gotta, 
We got a, a fish. Oh, fish cow Michael here. Limon! Mike. Show it, Michael. That's for Halibut Man out there. That's hey, the second. Get back there one more time. Let's see that fish. Walk Look that fish that. up to the camera a little close. Right there? Bro, oh, perfect. Beautiful. Mike. Now you can release that baby. That's what it's all about. All right. All right. Yep. Love it. Yep. <laughs> How does that get any better than that? I you tell get a live you, man. fish count. Live fish biting yeah. here on the Freeman Adventures <laughs> YouTube channel. Let me read a couple more comments. Okay. Remind you all to hit that like button. And if you'd like to get a Freeman Adventures hat or shirt, go to embroiderycreations.net and you can pick it up. Halibut Man says he stopped by Island Tackle yesterday after work, and it was really tough to keep his wallet in his <laughs> pocket. What a great shop. Yeah, man, you are so right, Mitchell. It is. Uh, Isaac says, good evening, gentlemen. Let's have some pissing fun. Do you know what that is? <laughs> it's a new reel. It's called pissing fun. Oh, so, yes, geez. that's one of my favorite hobbies, pissing fun. Cue ball. If you don't throw it in gear immediately, line starts shooting off the spool. Throw <laughs> it in gear and turn the handle. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh oh. Yep. Isaac wants to rile Danny up tonight, and this is a good way to do it. I know Danny. Danny, what do you think about the new rockfish regs? We're down to two vermilion per angler now. Two reds per well, angler. Well, I'm sure the fishing games down there are diving and, and looking and doing a, a real complete census like they always do. You know, it's political, you know, and I, you know, it's like with the, the cow cod feel to implement. Regulations and rules without really understanding and knowing them, you know that that's the problem I've had all these years with fishing game. You know, you got the blind leading the blind, and I'm going to give you a point that really bothers me right now. You know, Cal, we had the world class bass fishery in, in the world, and particularly in this country. Okay, freshwater bass fishing, California started implementing their own regulations because number one, they never addressed what we wanted to, them to address with the quagga mussels. Yeah. We had an advisory board and I was on the board with like Dave Myers and Vic Cutter, you know, a bunch of guys within the industry and uh, Pat Marley, we had a number of guys, I think Rick Rover, there's a lot of guys around that, that you know, for the bass, saying that, you know, build these ramps Fill them with a fluid that would kill these quagga mussels. Run them through your live well system, run your pumps, flush them out, drop it back down into the sump. Next boat would drive into it. You pump it up. You kill all this stuff, you know. The, we got to interrupt your show one more time. Man, Michael, Another you are on fire. Michael Limon. Holy smokes. And the calico bass are nibbling hey, down here. Folks, doesn't get any better than this. I'm going to hang you, this up, Mike. Give me a rod. Yeah, you want out of here, right? Phil's going to talk. <laughs> so, Abby, yeah. given what you're saying about all this, you're not a big fan of this vermilion rockfish no, cutting No, because in I, don't, I don't, you know what, what do we know? How much do they really know? I mean, you know, I know that, you know, like, uh, my, on, on my brother's boat, when they're doing the research, they have, they have uh, studies now where they can, because of the decompression chambers, Catch cow cod. You know how they used to blow? Oh, yeah. And uh, decompress it, put them back down with the tag and tracking them. And, you know, what do we really know about them? We didn't know that they, they moved that far. These things would trap. You know, when you look at a cow cod, um, doesn't look like a fish that would go from coast, or, you know, continent to continent like a tuna, right? The fact is they do travel a long distance. And because of some of those studies, they figured that out. So knowing that we don't know that much about it, how can you implement regulations on it? You know, it's the blind leading the blind, which is always the case in California, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not getting political. I'm just being very honest with you. You know, who's determining this? When I used to go do stuff in the hearings with Russ Eiser, we'd go up to UC Santa Barbara, and you'd deal with these biologists that are in college. How much time? And I would question them how much time they had on the water. And it was that much time. So that's how much respect I gave them, too. You know, because, you know, the time on the water, there's a lot of common sense things that we saw actually on the water fishing that, ex you know, we couldn't explain. Yeah. And we had more time on the water than they ever thought of, you know.
See, so. Isaac, I told you we were going to rile him up. Here he goes, Thanks, man. Thanks, Isaac. <laughs> great question, great answer. MD Gaff one. He was on the legend for the first trip of the year. How'd you do? You should fill us in on that, man. I hope you got him, Ooh. Omar. Um, I high stick because I am in love with the tug. Omar well, says, but you get the tug. If you want to stay on the tug for an hours and stuff when you could have had two or three fish by pointing the rod down and, and you know, just putting it in low, using the rock of the boat as the, the boat comes up, you hold, comes down. Here it is. Now, here's, here's you on a boat. You're high sticking, so you got one-tenth the power up here in a high stick, and the boat's going up and down. So by the time you wind down and you come back up, this fish can get its head down, okay? And the minute he gets his head down and he kicks, what's he doing? He's taking line off your reel. If, if you keep the pressure, if you're keeping, it could be as much as 10, 10 times the amount if you're almost pointing the rod at him. But, I mean, if you have that rod done at that angle, you know, and all you're doing is turning the handle with your button in and low, Every time that fish kicks, he's kicking toward you, you know. It's much easier for him to kick up. He'll gain line, you know. The only time he gets his head down is when you have less pressure on him. So here's where you got one-tenth of pressure. Where do you think he's going to get his head down? And then when you have a swell, and if you don't keep up with the timing on the swell, he'll get his head down, take a couple of kicks, takes line out, you know. And all that wear and tear going back and forth is also chewing, you know, little groove in the, your fluorocarbon or your mono, you know. So, you know, implementing the proper technique, trust me, practice putting it on the rail at a lower angle. I don't care whether you're using a graphite or a glass rod. You're going you're gonna to get a lot more pressure out of it. You know, the knuckleheads that are up here high t are telling me they really don't have an understanding of what's going on, you know, with the technical parts of it, you know. And, um, you know, I, we're here to help you put those fish on the boat. The, the nice part, too, is even if you want to release it, you know, if you're, you're going up and down fighting this fish and wearing it out, that fish is almost going to be dead by the time you get it to the surface. You know, if you're going to release it, if you bring it in hotter, you got to, you know, it's got a much more successful rate in release, too. So it's a win-win it's a deal, you know. But learning how to fish the correct angles and pulling the correct way, using the timing of the boat, using everything you have to your advantage, cutting the angle off on it, you know, and keeping that pressure on them, you know. Um, it's all going to help put those fish on quicker. Or you get it up to the surface if you don't want to lease it, that fish isn't beat to death and it's not dead by the time you get it to the surface too. So you, you'll have a nicer release. They can slide the gap down, pop the hook out, and, you know, Hopefully, it, you know, it's exposed to where they can knock it off, you know. But it gives them a better success, a release rate, too, if you bring them in hotter, you know. All right, good stuff. Uh, Billy Levette says, hey, Phil. Kevin Doran says hi. Oh, my God, I haven't heard that name, <laughs> Billy, for a thousand years. Kevin Doran, I went to school with him and his brother Mike and his sister Colleen actually went to Mexico with us. We... We're in an Indian village, in a Musco Indian village. She was a nurse, so she was doing her thing there. My brother Paul and I were teaching. So, hey, man, thanks for, uh, thanks for bringing that name up. Say hi to Kevin for me. Uh, and MD Gaff on that legend trip said, limits of wind on that first trip and three bluefin tuna for the boat, two on Mad Max. Hey, you know, April's a pretty windy month, and uh, if you get a day when it's not blowing, at least this year, it's really been phenomenal, but once that wind starts blowing, I get it. It makes it really tough. Matthew C., if you had to choose between graphite or glass rods for these bluefin tuna, which one would you choose? Danny, I think I know the it's, answer. It's not, even, not even close, but you have, to ha you have to have the understanding, you know, of how to fish. So you're going to go graphite, obviously. I go graphite all the way. It's a, it's, it, you know, how, I, there's, there's other analogies I can use. You know, but I mean, if you have, you have a car and it, with the same engine on a small light frame and a car with a big heavy metal frame, heavy body, which one's going to go faster? You know, which one's going to perform better? It's going to be the lighter one, folks. You know, so I mean, that's, you know, if, 
if if that were the case, we wouldn't be using composites and things like that going in jets and everything. We'd be using stainless steel because it's strong, you know, but it's it's too heavy. It takes too much, you know, horsepower to to move all that weight. So, you know, it's the same thing in fishing rods. It's just that understanding. You know, if you do high stick, if you're one of those kind of guys, yeah, you absolutely need fiberglass because you will blow up a graphite. I've never blown one up, but then... Like I said, I don't get it over 90 degrees, you know, and my idea is to get them on quicker, you know, so that the re recovery is much quicker. You know, graphic. Danny, the other side of it is I get what Omar is saying about he likes the tug and likes, you know, that bend in his rod. I get that. And I also get that when we grew up, they, if you, if That's, you didn't, didn't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, guys would tell you, don't point that rod yeah. at that fish. What's wrong? They'd scream at you. So... For many, many, many years in this business, people were taught that way to fish. So I think we're having a little trouble overcoming that. And as time goes by and people like you instruct the right way to pull on yeah. a fish, we'll get to the point where everybody's doing that. Maybe. And, and in fact, you know, you are putting more pressure on it too because we're using spectra. There's no elongation in the line. It's straight. I do use a top shot. Sometimes I'll implement so much mono and then my fluorocarbon. So you do have a little element of stretch, but not a lot, very little compared to, you know, enough as far as I'm concerned, you know, that I'll put on maybe 50 feet or whatever, a mono, and then my, my six, five, six feet of fluorocarbon. But, uh, you know, when you have no stretch and you're, you're getting that, that line and you keep that head coming on that fish as it's, as it's planing up, every time he kicks, he's kicking at you, Okay. But when you got you got so much flex and these things are going through the water like this, if the head is down and kicks his, you know, kicks his tail, he's taking line on you. So you know you just lost everything there. You're between doing this and that, you know. So if you're keeping more pressure on him down here and just winding, and I by that time I'm dropping it in low and I'm turning the handle. Every time they kick, they're kicking themselves right to the boat, right up. In a circle, and all you got to do is keep up with it. You know, if you want to fight them that way, I'm, I can't. I, I can't stop you from fighting them any way. I'm just trying to save you some effort, you know, and get on to your next fish. But you know, at at, at my age too, yeah, I don't want to be on them for an hour and a half to hour. You know, if I can put them on quick, yeah. All right, very good. Hey, the over and underline tonight on Michael Limon catching fish presently is six. Okay, so. You can make your bets out there. Will he catch less than six fish or more than six fish? And with that, we have a whole slew of <laughs> comments about Michael. Halibut Man says, Michael can't be stopped. Isaac says, Michael, great work. Cue ball says, nice. Checkerboard. Matthew C., nice one. So, man, Michael Limon is stealing the Danny Cadota show tonight. And you oh, know what? Oh, he's got four fish. Danny a loves and that. Three, and three calicos and a mackerel. Yeah, oh, Man, he's... I'm talking about what he shows on the show. So oh, okay, we're at two okay, now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and six is the over He's under. a very credible fisherman. What are you so betting, I'm... by the way, over or under six? I'd say over. Over six. Yeah, All he's right. on a roll. Well, we'll he's say, got I'm... something dialed in. I'm not going to bet mean... against him, Whew. man. Exactly. All right, so stay tuned. Michael will be running in and out of here as long as we are live on the air. So we'll uh, keep you in touch with all of that. Uh, Kim Herbert says, any merch... On the indie trip, um, you know, we've got a bunch of stuff that we're giving away to you guys. Merch-wise, my guy just sent me a message and says, hey, i got to print up some new stuff. We've sold so much. So I'm working with him to make sure we will have some on board, Kim. But right now we're starting to get low on several sizes. I'll keep you in touch with that. But I do have some surprises for you when you get on board. Cue ball just going to be floaters everywhere. What a waste. And he's talking about when you throw a vermilion back or a rockfish that comes up from depth, they float away. Now, everybody's required to have a descending device. So somebody, I don't know how you do that. I guess you've got to take one deck in and put him on yeah, you the do. descending device, yeah, right? You yeah, do. You yeah. Know, I know like on the outer limits, they got a decompression chamber, you know, but that's when they're doing the studies yeah. for fishing game. Yeah, right? so you throw a whole bunch in there, yeah. right? And then drop and the whole basket down. Put them down. Yeah. That would behoove, I would do that if I were us. I mean, oh, it's absolutely. not that hard. You can do that with a milk crate. I've, yeah. I've seen it yeah. done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I get what you're talking about. Um, Daniel Sansi says, hello, Omar. 
I really pushed fish and game at the Bart Hall show, and they had nothing but shoulder shrugs. Seems they are absolutely just guessing. So Omar, it sounds like, grilled the fish and wildlife and said, hey, what's the data here? What, give me a data-driven argument or, uh, you know, a reason why you're... And they just shrugged their shoulders, according to Omar. So, yeah, yeah that I mean, goes I along got with what you're saying. Omar, if you want some somebody to give you questions to ask them, just give me a call. You could ask, I, you know, because over the years, like I said, I questioned that. Um, we gave them consulting advice from, like I said, from the freshwater scene, too. On, and that was not just me. We had a lot of industry guys um, implementing, you know, we were going to have them, like you say, build ramps. We have a fluid that would kill off the quagga mussels. And that's one of the main things. Now, how dumb is it to take away an indigenous bait, for instance, like a crawdad, which was, at that time, it was the main bait for those trophy bass, and now outlaw it. Seems kind of dumb when they, they, they come direct. I mean, they propagate right in the lakes, all the lakes, and to not be able to use something that's a, a live bait that's, you know, from the particular lake, those particular waters, is not, a, to me, not a real smart thing. But what can I tell you? I don't know. You know, yeah. these guys drive you crazy. I, Isaac says, hey, he's got a brand new idea for your show. He said, you got to move the show out on the docks and get Danny and Michael <laughs> live action fishing while you're doing your show. It's not a bad idea. I can do that. I can That's do that. pretty good. Yeah. Patrick and I did a coast-to-coast -coast show where Patrick was fishing for bass in Florida and Michael was fishing here on the docks, and that went over big time with everybody. There you go. Everybody liked that. Hey, there maybe we'll have to do that, Isaac. Good idea. Kevin Doran says hello. Hey, Kevin, I just mentioned you and your sister and brother and everybody, and, of course, you were such dear friends, your mom and dad, to my parents, so really good to see you here. Kevin, I hope you are doing well. Nate says, gents. Yeah, I think that's us. Well, at least Danny's a gentleman. The rest of us, I don't know. Daniel Lightfoot says, hit that like button. And we deeply appreciate it when you do that. And Mackie, I don't know why it doesn't show up here, the likes, but there's way more. Well, let's see. I, I can't see how many, but there's way more than that one. All right, so don't get, don't get panicked. All right, um, let's see. More than six, obviously. Oh, yeah, that's Michael's over and under Oh, yeah, line. yeah, yeah. Steve yeah. Bermudez, hey, Danny. If they fish tuna using kites and balloons, why not use a Roland Martin bobber? You know, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> What's a Roland? You're going to have to brief me on it. I and know. Ironically, I almost thought about running down to Bass Pro last night to see Roland. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. about it, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we should have. Yeah. You know him, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that would have been some good Well, video. I think I showed you the picture of... I showed you a picture of at one of the uh, Bassetons when he met Judy. Oh, that's Packer, right. And then a week later, they were married. And it's yeah. been, what, 30-something years now? At least that, you know? So they've been blessed. Yeah. But yeah, no, no. But A hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh, there we go. You're showing some pictures of that. Uh, yeah. I got to get back to the next question just real quick. There we go. Okay. Um, and then we can, you can go back to that. Uh, he's got Michael for over six. What's Michael's setup there? What is Michael fishing with? Just a hook and sinker, right? Like a Carolina rig? Split yeah. shot? Carolina rig. Oh, Carolina, yeah. That's what he's doing. Uh, Jason Lawler, the master chef on board the Amigo. Hopefully we'll see you tonight, Jason. I know the Amigo's running. I don't know if you're on there or not, but it would be great to see you. My friend, Steve Bermuda. Oh, no. Uh, there we are. Rick Slater. Hey, Danny, did you ever bass fish? With live bait, shiners, crawdads. Oh man, is he gonna hear about crawdads or goldfish? Were your giants on beds? No, Danny, first were... of all, tell yeah. everybody what your giants. How big were they exactly? I've got I, I've got a, a 1904, 18 and three quarter. I I uh, Koopy caught one of my fish with my hook in it, and it was 20.3 back on Taka's Rock. Are these uh, records? Uh, well, the 1904 still is a standing line class record. Wow! Yeah, for uh, they put it was a 20 pound class, and what it was, I was using 10 pound Berkeley XT, which breaks at 17, so that pops you into the 20 pound class. But it was 10 pound XT is what I I used because there was very little stretch in that line, 
So when, this is prior to Spectra. So when you set the hook, you could, you could feel that tick of the, the barb going into the bass, you know. But yeah, and then I unbuttoned one. I could see this. That was, it was up there. He wants to know, did you fish live bait? Yeah, I did. I did. The only time, we fished a little bit of shiners down in San Diego, but I, I, I didn't get my big fish down there. It was so competitive because you had the whole San Diego fleet, the Sansom brothers, John Look. Collins, Buzzy, um, you know, Ray Montero. You had some great fishermen down there, and, you know, they had the home field advantage, folks. Face, face it. I mean, it was just like us. It can't stay. You can see this. We had somewhat of an edge because that was our, those were our home lakes, you know. He wants to know if your giants were on beds. No, they weren't. We were, you, you know, um, what we found out was that those bigger fish were coming up, and it seemed like um, it was a hierarchy type deal. It seemed like the bigger fish would spawn earlier, so we would get a lot of my big fish came in January and February. Typically, the March is in, uh, typically March is the month for the spawning of the majority of the fish. But, you know, I think like anything, you know, being the bigger fish, they had the priorities on the spots they wanted to feed on and everything else. And I think that had, there was kind of a hierarchy. And it seemed like on those particular spots. But there's, there was a key thing. And I'll disclose this, people. Pay attention to this. This is pretty crucial. But, you know, just like with fishing offshore, fishing the islands and everything, one of the main, you know, the main things that you're concerned with is the structure you're fishing on and how you're sitting on the structure with respect to the current, okay? Now, back in those days, there's about that many guys that understood there was current in those lakes, okay? And the majority of them were saltwater captains on boats, right? And because if you look, if you look at fishing, you know, Cortez Bank or Tanner Bank, depending on which way the current's coming, you know, if you're on the wrong side of the bank, folks, you're out in, uh, you're out in left field, you know, and you're out there standing on, you're waving a flag, but you're not going to get the, you're not going to get anybody coming through there, you know. So being on the leading edge of the current on those particular spots and I'm going to give you one key thing. So I hope you guys are listening. Take note of this. On Casitas and Castaic, where there's current, there's a couple of spots where the current comes into these spots and the current splits. And on those particular spots, we hooked our biggest fish. I hooked one uh, at Casitas. I'm not going to tell you the spot, but on the, it split the current. And when you cast down, you know, you cast out and it was go down to the inside of the cove. It was kind of similar to the one at Castaic, too. But it split the current. That's where um, I hooked a lot of those big fish. A lot. And I know that, uh, like, even um, Krupi's 20 was caught on the same spot. So, you know, but it has to do with the current, how it runs on these spots. And, and if you're on a trolling motor, you don't know where the current's going because you're not holding a constant. So it mandated using double anchors to determine exactly which way the currents were because it, you would set up on those spots accordingly. And that, you know, of course, we got that from running saltwater boats. You know, you have to sit on the, wrong, the right, right sides of the points or, you know, or the high spots to determine where you want to anchor up and that, you know, you want to be on the leading edge so that you, when you're throwing the bait out, it's taking it to them on the, on the spots. And they're, they're in a feeding station looking for that bait coming into that spot. So there's, there was a lot of homework and a lot of years that went into that and, and uh, figuring a lot of those things out. But a lot of it was implemented and brought over from the ocean. You know, and when you had saltwater skippers, like I said, like the Sansom brothers, Buzzy and, and Nick and uh, Ray Montera down in San Diego, and Sansom brothers, like I said, uh, up here was Taka. Kenny Hess used to fish with a lot, you know. Uh, uh, Steve Tanaka, one of my old captains. But a lot of guys that bass fished up there. And, and, you know, we got guys like Butch Brown's been around, but Butch fished the after me. And uh, he just would catch and release tons of, could be the same fish, but I mean, he's, he's definitely the goat. His dedication 
to the big bass fishing is unlike anybody else's that I've ever known. Because every time I'd come down from the main lake at Castaic, I would see them down in the lagoon. So put in that time out of the water, there's no, no sacrifice, you know, for, uh, for putting time on the water. There's nothing like it, you know. And uh, that's why he's earned that uh, title of the goat because he's, he's put his time in and he's, he's caught the fish. You know. All right, good stuff. Hey, yeah. uh, Billy Levet is back, and he has a question about Taka Tanaka. He said that he knows Steve was running boats, but his brother did. Did his brother become a doctor? No, no, Marty. Yeah, no, he has got two brothers, Marty and Dell. No, they did, but yeah, but we had uh, you know both uh, Steve and Marty on on the Mustang with us, and we we're blessed to have them. They were all, both captains. Yeah, and maybe you can tell everybody who Taka was. Well, Taka what was a good my, friend, and Taka he's still was, around, right? Taka's still around. He's my mentor. I fished with him, and he was. You know, I bought the Mustang from him, but he was, you know, my basic mentor that taught me the most about, you know, running a sport boat. You know, and I did work with George Mio a little bit and a few other guys, but you know, Taka was the main guy, and I bass fished him too. Bass fished with him, so. Constantly on the phone with him and fishing with him a lot, too. So, you know, there was a lot of the uh, methodologies that we developed together, you know, when we were fishing the double anchoring and things like that that made it, uh, you know, very consistent catching some of these bigger largemouth. All right, beautiful. Omar says that uh, the people that are managing California would outlaw palm trees in California if they could. <laughs> well, I'm sure they would. I'm sure they would, yeah. Tim P says he went grunion hunting. He said fishing, but yeah, grunion fishing or hunting. How do you cook and eat these bony little things? Have you ever cooked them? You you deep fry the hell out of them, right? I and then guess you, you eat I, the bones, I, right? I, I I guess I don't know. I've never even had one, but I, really, they're, they're too bony. Yeah, yeah. you've had them, right? Yeah, so yeah. Dan, speak up. Go ahead. Just deep fry them. Cut, take the guts out. Deep fry them, and then you just eat them like French fries. Cut the heads off. Yeah, I cut the heads off. But I had some friends that ate the heads, though, because they were uh, that scent. They ate heads and everything. Yeah, so, like Danny. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you just deep, deep, once you deep fry them, because the bone gets all brittle, you don't yeah. even know it's... Yeah, so I, I don't know if you could hear him, Tim, but uh, he's right. Uh, Dan, uh, Daniel uh, Lightfoot, I almost call him Lighthouse, but it's Dan Lightfoot, who is Michael E. Bones' grandpa, says you deep fry them to the point where they're so crunchy that the bones are brittle and you just munch them down. I've had them a few times, but not in any recent time. Uh, and uh, he's right. That's exactly how you do it. It's like a French fry, right? Or, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you get a good enough batter and some salt on there, they're good. Yep. Dip them in some tartar sauce. Man, I'll tell you, you think you died and gone. No, you just think you died, actually. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Steve Bermudez. We can call it the Bodacious Bobber. All right, <laughs> Steve. Bobber, yes. yeah. Steve is a bodacious boober, let me tell you. <laughs> well, um, that, was, that was our our video we made, Bodacious Bass. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, Jason Lawler is not cooking on the Amigo, but he's on his way down. So drop in and say hi, Jason. We'd love to see you. Dan Ooh. Smith in beautiful San Diego, California, with his lovely wife, Kim, who I think they're both on the carnivore diet, although... Dan has not been talking about it lately, so something tells me he may have fallen off. We'll find out. <laughs> uh, man, I just got in. Starting the show over. Hello, Phil, Captain Danny, and all you great folks watching. Dan, it's always great to see you. The over-under on Michael Limon. Dan is six fish. He's got two calico bass so far. Every time he catches a fish, he runs in here and shows it. So he needs to put another four on the board to get to the number and five to go over. So everybody around here is betting the over. We'll see see how that winds up here tonight. Omar, Danny, you got any trout stories? I got back from Kern River, and it was mighty fun nailing those trout. Well, you know, Omar, I, I started out trout fishing, uh, you know, when I was very young, you know. Um, actually tying my own hooks with my grandparents and going up the Sierras, uh, you know, and fishing the stream. So I fished the streams first. And in some respect, it, it kind of teaches you how to fish the currents and, and using the, the current, fishing the undercuts, fishing around rocks. I mean, using structure, you know, in a stream. And it was Bishop Creek is where I, you know, cut my, my teeth. And, um, you know, so 
but I fished everything. You know, I fished the lakes, I fished everything, and, and trout was always a big part of my fishing background at one point before I got into bass fishing. Um, but yeah, I mean, what can I tell you? I mean, I took my two-year-old and four-year-old grandkids, we were down at the show, down at the, you know, uh, Pacific Coast show, and uh, Kira, I got some video. Phil, did we get that video? Did I ever sh shoot you that video that we had from Kira? Yeah, we ran okay, that on yeah. the morning briefing. Okay, yeah. right, right. Well, my two-year-old. Oh, you know what? There's nothing better, folks. And so this summer, you know, I'm taking both the two and four-year-old, plus all the other grandkids, and I've got rods for them. And uh, we're going to go up and spend some time in the Sierras. And, you know, we're going to honor my dad up there. We're going to do a memorial for him. Nice. And at the same time, take all the kids fishing. Because that, the, the trout fishing as a family was a, an event that we always, you know, we, we spent and had many great, great trips over the years with. And I want them to experience the same thing. Yeah. All right, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I think Danny, you just love fishing, right? Being out in the outdoors oh, yeah. and that was it. And it's hard to hard to beat that. That is for sure. Uh, Jeff Yeomans, five forty slinger, a Navy man. Thank you for your service, Jeff. Oh, he absolutely. says good evening, Phil and Danny. Andrew H says I remember riding my bike after school years ago to Lake Poway and using live crawdads from the little tackle shop. They work. Well, you know, it's an essential part of their diet. And, you know, when you're targeting those big fish, they needed that calcium and cholesterol for the egg development. And so that, you know, we, we found that that was probably the most, cons that was the most consistent bait at that time. We tried over the years where it was legal to use mudsuckers, uh, water dogs, and we spent a ton of money on, on live bait. And it was a pain because they the water dogs you'd have to keep in a refrigerator at home, keep them refrigerated. Uh, but the crawdads, I would have a hundred dozen. I had ten bins with ten dozen in each bin, and I would cure them in the same manner that I would cure bait on the boat. All the weak stuff would die off. So when I when I put and I would change the water every night, which was a lot of work. But when I went out to the lakes, I had cured crawdads. So when they hit the water, if it wasn't like a a sardine taking off down and away and thumping. And they can tell, they'll tell you, when there's a fish there, there's a different panic thump that the tail has. And that mandated fishing the very best tackle. I wish we had Spectra then at that point because I would have been able to fill a little bit more and, and fluorocarbon. But with the mono, I used the mono that had less elongation so I could set the hook quick. It was thinner. Um, I camouflaged it with the green pen like uh, Doug Hannon had showed me. And, uh, you know, you had at the time that was what I considered state of the art. But, you know, fishing that live bait, that bait, fish that cure bait, they'll tell you when there's a fish there. They panic like a sardine or a mackerel does when they shell fill on them. So, you know, that was a nice deal. All right, good stuff. Yeah. Hey, uh, Calico Chris, who happens to be one of the nicest guys around. He was at our surf fishing event down on the beach, and then he went to Bass Pro Shops out there in Rancho, where we had a really big crowd. That was great. Chris, always good to see you here, my friend. Greg Bates wants to know if Billy uh, did your own the Indian. And I think he meant, did your dad own the Indian? Yeah, and yes, sure Greg, did. Bud Levette owned the Indian. Yep. And we were just talking about that. It sounds like you may have joined us a little bit late, Greg, but... Yeah, uh, Bud owned it, and Dolores, uh, his daughter, was the galley the cook. cook. Yep, yep. And, uh, yeah, so Billy is here joining us. He's good friends with a guy I went to grammar school with, Mike, or uh, Kevin Doran, I should say. So, good stuff. Steve Bermudez, only one for Mike. I've lost the context. One what? Do you know what he's talking about? <laughs> Come okay. back. Everybody in the whole studio, Steve, is shaking their, oh, I mean three. Oh, well, that clarifies everything. <laughs> now I know what you're talking about. Yeah, three. Yeah, 100%. Uh, no, I never owned the Indian, just my dad. My career was working in hospitals, hotels in Beverly Hills as maintenance engineering. But thank you for asking. Yeah, Billy Levette's famous here tonight. Steve Bermudez is back again. Uh, it sounds like he may be into the tequila tonight. He means one, he means three, and now he says, Danny, have you ever fished? Southern Lake in San Diego. I've never even heard of Southern Lake. I haven't either. Uh, yeah, yeah. Steve, Steve is definitely in the tequila tonight. <laughs> uh, well, let me ask you the question this way. Do you like one, 
a three or a southern lake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I've, I've never fished any of them. We never even heard of any. But hey, keep trying. Yes, yeah, Steve. You know, maybe you got to get the big crayon for Steve, me. Steve, you know? stop that tequila. <laughs> Uh, Robert Graver, who's up there in the 805, made his debut this morning on the morning briefing playing the guitar fish. I like that, Robert. Oh. Good evening, Phil and Danny. Happy Holy Thursday to the Friedman Adventure family. Today's a very important day for Christians around the world, Danny, right? Absolutely. Yep, good stuff. All right, Robert, good to see you there. No question about it. So, what else is going to happen here in the next uh, month or so? Are we going to see any barracuda around here? Oh, what, you know, this what? water temp is kind of you know you get too much wind, the water temps reduce. Yeah. So, what will that you know be conducive for, Phil? Mm, you know, and it, I'll be cold. You know, and, you know what's really funny? <laughs> Probably one of the record years we ever had was 1984. Okay, for Albies, and it came after a very hot year, 83, when the water was super hot, and and that transition time within so many months, we had Albies in one day range. Are you calling for Albacore on tonight's rippling? show, Danny? Well, you know, I don't know. The thing Do was, it. The thing was, we kind of, I remember that year. It was phenomenal fishing, but we had rationing of anchovies. So there, it was funny because there wasn't a lot of anchovies. And I was blessed to have been at uh, Seaforth because if I was over on the other side of the San Diego Bay, the guys were getting rationed. Where in Seaforth, um, the Fortune and I were the only overnight boats. Back then, C-14 didn't even have overnight boats, boats going offshore. So we would tank, I'd tank 100 scoops a night and have to, you know, go outside, meet my brother and transfer bait over the Cherokee a lot of times, you know. But, um, you know, that's, those are all the things that we, that we dealt with. It was the cooler water. And we just, all you can say is keep your fingers crossed, folks. I, uh, think, I think. Go ahead. Yeah. We never know. Kim Herbert went to Rio Bravo's Mexico this past weekend for a mission trip. Searched all over Progreso for a San Marcos blanket. No luck, sorry. Hey, are you up on this? Do you know what he's talking no. about? Well, so here's the deal, Danny. San Marcos I'll give blanket? you the whole story now. Let me give you the whole story. A San Marcos blanket in Mexico is a really heavy blanket. I had one in China. And it had the Blessed Mother on it. So I, I had that. And, you, you know, in China, you're not going to go down and buy any Christian stuff. Yeah, so I had yeah. that. And my wife left me a voicemail and said, I really want a San Marcos. And she, she knows how to lay it on with a meal more, my love, please, you know. <laughs> and by the way, well, I'll, I'll keep. So I looked all over. San, uh, all over Ensenada, they don't make them anymore because they became too costly. They're so oh, heavy yeah, yeah. and everything, so we can't find them. And I'll let you in on the true story of this. So I did a whole video on it. People were stopping me in Ensenada, the fish taco guy going, hey, get your wife that San Marcos. She's going to kill you. And did a whole funny thing. And I sent that to my wife, the video. Yeah. And she goes, oh, that's funny. You know, that's good. And so I posted it on YouTube. And then like a day or two later, she said, hey, that video, that's between you and I, right? That's not, that's a thing with <laughs> uh, us. I don't, oops. and I go... Of course, Mia Moore. Oh, she's going to kill me if she ever finds it. She's not on any social media or anything, but she is absolutely going to cut my throat if she ever finds out. So, hey, thank you so much for looking for that thing. Rick Slater says, I love Danny's honesty so much I ordered a faded gray hat. Man, Danny sold a hat tonight for free. There you go. Man, Rick, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. David Alcantar, who was at the Bass Pro Shop Seminar I gave. David's a great guy. Hi, hi, howdy, party people. I'm just tuning in. I finally got my tatty book and saw Danny on there going to paint a few jigs Mustang green now. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for my book. I'm, I'm sure, you know, I saw pallets that Scott was shipping out. So They're beautiful, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, they're absolutely gorgeous. And I got it, got it at the show. So I'm expecting it anytime. I can't wait. Heck, Danny, you're the one who broke the story on that several months ago, and then the first look that oh, the public Scott got in, right? yeah. at, at the book was on your show yeah, right here. Yeah, you got it. We good stuff. Scott in for that. Good stuff. Joe Russo says, good evening, Phil, and my guru, Danny, always great watching the program. Get ready. The big ones are coming. Let's go. Hey, Goomba, you got the boat fired up, and you're going to meet me down here at the dock again. We'll hop on. We'll do it. We, we, we did a... 
last minute goof off. Was it last year, Joe? I think, and we went out there and we whacked a bunch. The bluefin. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That I was remember fun. you guys. That was fun. We had a good. Pete time. Demers was he there? No, Pete wasn't on that one. Uh huh. Pete wasn't on that one. Uh, yeah, we we whacked him. He had a he had a bunch of uh, his friends, but I think they were more novices. So we kind of handing handed them off to the guys, but it was it was good fishing. Yeah. And did you use the rail assist pipe that Joe Russo has developed? It is phenomenal. We didn't have it on Joe's boat uh-huh. at that point, and they were smaller fish, so yeah. we didn't really need it. We yeah, just, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Just muscle them. But on. now, and that keeps yeah. that rod at the oh, right angle, God. right? That thing's beautiful, beautiful. Thank it's you, Joe. Be a game changer for all you guys uh, and the small boats and yachts. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alan R. Wow, they're really tagging you, Steve. For me and the boys, it was nice to see you at Phil's seminar at Bass Pro Shops in Rancho. Alan, thank you so much for being there and for representing me last night at the Bass Pro uh, Shops uh, grand opening over there in Irvine. I really appreciate Aaron wearing the Freeman Adventures hat and representing. Greg Bates, yep, late. Started my fishing on life on that boat. This guy's in the tequila, too. Um, (laughs) Indian with my dad. Billy, thank you for all the great times. We were young then. Yes, astute observation, Greg, for sure. (laughs) Yes, Greg's a good guy. You know Greg. He hangs around here sometimes. Oh, good. You know, some people grab their mace when they see him, but he's really a nice guy. (laughs) You know, I almost thought about going running down to Irvine yesterday, last night. Yeah, because you know all those big shots, Yeah, Roland and all those guys, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what can you tell us about Roland Martin? Is he a you nice know, guy? Here's, Roland's a great guy, you know. And um, I didn't, he, he wanted to do a show and it was off off season. And so I didn't want to do it unless we were doing it at the right time of year, which is like January, February, you know, maybe March at the latest. Uh, but I did get Mart, I did, I got Roland to do a five deer on Bobby Taft's boat when the Top Gun was brand new. And we went out to Guadalupe. And I told Roland, I said, I'm not going to do any old show. If we're going to do something, we're going to do something that people haven't seen, you know, because I, I kind of think in my head, you know, if I'm, I just don't want to do another bass show or another tuna show. But, you know, the neat part about Guadalupe is we had a phenomenal bite there on that grade up to 80-something pounds. And uh, we got footage of the great whites coming right to the boat, chomping them in half. Oh, that's so, cool. I mean, we got some beautiful footage. Yeah, that's better. But, I mean... Just the fishing there, Guadalupe, was so different for him. And he had Judy with him, you know. Then it made a great show. And he cut several different shows out of that one episode, you know, because we went around the back, had a yellowtail show that we were able to cut out of the footage, you know. But mainly the big part was, you know, catching those, catching the bigger, the nicer yellowfin and the great whites, you know. So it was fun. But, yeah, I wanted to run down and say hi, you know, but... uh, Got tied up. We had the kids over, and you know, my little granddaughters they take priority right now, folks. Sorry. That sounds good yeah. to me. Quentin yeah. Traccia. Hey, Phil and Danny, thanks for another great show. It's becoming my Thursday thing, man. I love it, man. We 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 have to be so grateful. Oh, for that's these awesome, people. guys. Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, so you got any questions? If I can't answer them, I'm not going to BS you. But you know, uh, give us a heads up. If I, if I don't have the answer, I'll research it for you. But, you know, we've been blessed to be around fishing, you know, since I was four years old. So, you know, and, and taking it very seriously all my life. So I have a question. Yeah. Have you seen halibut fishing this good before in your life? I mean, the pride oh. is getting set to leave here at 20 seconds. I could believe the, the limits. I yeah. I get limits like, I mean, you know. I, 16 I guys, 80 that. halibut on the yeah. pride a month ago. Unbelievable. So. Yeah. Unbelievable fishing. It's yeah. been incredible. Yeah. I know the Native Sun today had only one halibut. It's been a little slow here locally lately, but they've had a phenomenal derby they put together. I think they're pushing 200 legal halibut since they started, you know, in November or whenever That's it was. That's awesome. That's, That's awesome. about as good as it gets. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We never considered it anything steady, but I mean, it was always a, a bonus fish, you know, but the way it's going now, you know, it's it's been steady for a lot of these guys. Alan wants to know, will Janny, Danny join you on any of your charters? No, we don't allow Danny on the <laughs> charters. So he's, he, he, he shows everybody up. It just gets to the point where he catches. Yeah, of course. We'll, I'll show Danny our schedule and we'll find out. Yeah, summertime would be the best shot. 
Yeah, so every time I have, I got the time. Aaron was yeah. modeling the faded gray Freeman Adventure hat for you, and he was doing a great job, let me tell you. Fantastic. Back to that halibut. Man, it has been absolutely incredible this year, and uh, I don't know how it can get much better. No, oh, the beginning of the wax on the white sea bass there, too, out there, so it's been pretty awesome. Yeah. You want to talk to this guy? <laughs> Jason Lawler, he's the galley chef on board the Amigo. Why don't I let him sit down with you and you can little... talk to him? Listen, guys. Jason, you can fill us in here. Come here. Sure. I'm not going to kiss you. I'm just going to put a microphone. Yeah, right. Uh, I know you want to. Be careful. Be careful. I don't I know. know you want to. He may be lying, yeah. he may be lying right about that, that one. Bend down here. Right here. No. no. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in Mexico. I don't know what you have. <laughs> Thanks. Well, you know, guys, <laughs> when, it, when it comes down to it, there's nothing more important than these guys. Let me tell you. That's the toughest job on the boat, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's, pretty, it's pretty fun, too. You know? Yeah. Because they can always say, yeah, I'm fishing. <laughs> I'm fishing, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, jeez, man, we're just getting started. So um, we went out on a crew trip, what, last week? Maybe, what, a week ago now? Um, we did decent. Uh, we were out there with all the other boats at Catalina. Just a fun trip. Um, this is going to be our first trip going out. I'm not on this trip. I was hoping to get out, but it's sold out. So um, I'm hearing they may go to Cl uh, Clemente. Um, I mean, I was hoping they go to Catalina because I was going to chase them down on my boat. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see, you know, how it goes. But that's what I hear what they're going to do. And they're going to do the uh, whole, you know, the usual uh, halibut, uh, sea bass, yellowtail type of thing, bass. Hey. Look for that kind of thing. It's that time of year. They've been whacking them on a, you know, you get in the right place at the right time and it's bingo. Exactly. And who knows what's going on at Clemente? Nobody's been out there as far as I've heard. I mean, I'm sure there's a few people out there, yeah. private boats yeah. and stuff, but yeah. there's not a lot of info coming out. Everybody's really been, as I've been noticing, has been targeting Catalina mostly. Um, and you don't really see anything farther out than that. Like, I mean, we're hoping to get out to Nick soon. I mean, those are wow. what the trips are going to do well, well. as soon as the weather permits. I mean, we got a bunch of trips lined up for next week. Um, we need some reservations. I know towards the end of the week we're getting there, so. Cool, cool. Are the squirts floating? Um, we got lucky. Um, we didn't have much bait here. We got fin bait when we went out. Um, we went out to Catalina, and we were able to make uh, a half a tank of squid for us. We had 14 guys. We had plenty of squid for us. Uh, they had to work all through the evening, just like the pride does. Sure, sure, um, sure. You know, pull in, you know, two, three, four, you know, 15 a scoop, you know, and then they sure. filled it up for us. So we, uh, But it was even. Half and half. Half wow. the fish were on cool. squirts, half the fish were on fin bait. So it was back and forth both ways. That's Probably awesome. Probably even. And some fish were even on plastics. Yeah, so <laughs> we got halibut vision. on plastics. I mean, we came back with, uh, I think it was 12 or 14 legal halibut. Nothing big. And then we probably released 20. And probably had another 20 short bites because they're a little finicky. You yeah, know, when you start talking about the numbers you're talking about back in our day, when you get more than a couple, I mean, that's a heck of a day. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, the numbers you guys are putting up, I mean... Unbelievable these days. Exactly. That's unreal. Yeah. That's awesome. My hat's off to you guys, man. Yeah, I can't wait to That's get it started. Awesome. So I'll be out next week. I know for sure I'm going to be towards the end of the week, but if we could fill up some trips, I'll be out there a little bit more. I'm chomping at the bit. If I'm not fishing, I'm going to be on my boat going out there. So <laughs> I mean, my that boat's in the water right good, now. pretty good, folks. <laughs> yeah. Good odds. Yeah. Yeah. Jason, cool. take a look back at the lobster season. Oh, man. Out. What a great lobster season. I mean, me personally, just counting my numbers on my ticket, I had over 200. Um, I nice. didn't count how many trips. That's probably 20 trips or something like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, you got seven per, so that's 25 trips or whatever. But I haven't even counted all my, because I've kept everybody that's gone on my boat. I've kept all of their cards, so I need to count theirs up, too. So, I mean, I'm, we're going to be close to 300 lobster for probably 30, 40 trips, maybe. Like, and we went to Catalina maybe three times. Wow. And the rest was in the harbor, the rest of it. I mean, all on the last day stuff, we huh? went out, I got nine. And the night before, all my buddies got one or zero. or So oh, it worked out in the end. He had it dialed in. Yeah, and I yeah, took yeah, the guys yeah. from the Amigos. So we were out there. Me, George, my other uh, chef. And then we took uh, Sonoda with us. So <laughs> that's probably why we did it, because we had Sonoda, the good luck charm. <laughs> Jeez. But yeah, it was a great season. I mean, um, there's a lot of pressure out there. That's the one thing. Um, but there's a lot of help out there, and you figure it out. I mean, I've been doing it for five or six years now on my yeah. boat. So you figure it out just trying things and moving spots. And I'm telling you, you'll catch a million one day on one spot and think it's the honey hole. You'll go there the next day or the next week and not catch anything on that spot. So it's typical fishing. Yep, right? exactly. Yeah. You've got to know your spots and just move around them and yeah. figure it out, yeah. you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. Have, have backups oh, to awesome. backups. <laughs> wow, that's hey, tremendous. Jason, just one question about the galley. It's more than boat burgers on the Amigo. You're a chef. You like to put out some incredible meals. Can you give us an example? Well, we're, of course, always doing, you know, your breakfast burrito, but we're doing it with, like, chorizo and linguiza. Uh, we're doing our normal, like, I was making um, waffle breakfast sandwiches, that kind of stuff. But for lunches, we're doing your typical uh, boat burgers, but we do it, you know, like how you would have it at In-N-Out where it's all shredded and, you know, nice beef and all that. And then we're doing a lot of other things, too, like we're doing pulled pork sandwiches and tacos and, you know, with rice and beans and all the sides. And then if you come out on a trip that's what I would suggest is going on a, a, a day and a half or longer trip, you're going to get into dinners where we're doing, you know, if it's an upscale one, we'll do prime rib or we'll do uh, pork tenderloin, um, you know, with mashed potatoes, all those kind of things. So um, you're going to see a lot of different stuff out there. You know, a lot of times we're doing fried rice and all that. So it just oh, depends yeah. on the trip, and we mix it up a lot, so it's cool. not always the same thing all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we're always trying to switch it up to keep it fun for us, too, as the chefs. Well, you guys have taken that to a whole different level from what we had when we were running boats, you know. I was I was proud of the fact that we were first ones to do the fried rice because of the big grill, you know. Uh, George Mio would do it on the Hustler, but he had a small grill. He'd do it for the crew, but, you know, couldn't didn't have enough room to do like I would I bought the 30 cup rice cooker and we feed the whole whole you know I mean yeah, max it out and then some yeah <laughs> but yeah yeah and it was easier you, you know back in the old days right in the galley we had to have you know guys got a choice of ham sausage bacon well what a pain you get up you'd have to get up early for to get all this stuff on the grill and then you don't know what you're going to have but you yep. know when we started doing the fried rice everybody started saying First, we did it for the uh, slanted. I got my my people, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, all the we called you guys round eyes. All the round eyes said, "Hey, we want that. <laughs> we want that." So we started doing fried rice. And yeah, I mean, you look now. I mean, generally, you go on a long range boat. Fried rice is probably going to be on the menu. One of the yeah, we're going to be doing like local mocos always yeah. on exactly. there. You can't that, lose. You know, you can't it's go wrong. Great, you know, man. all that Hawaiian type of food. Exactly. You know, pokey and exactly. all that kind of stuff. Because we're always doing snacks. If you're going on trips, we're there doing snacks. Go. I think I'm going to do a lot of soups and stuff starting the beginning of the season just because it's a little colder out cool. there for yeah, the mornings, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so that's something that's a that great lasts. Idea. That's and a it's great fun idea. and easy, and I can use stuff from the previous trips to sure, make, you know, for sure. the meats and stuff. So. Oh, that's awesome. It's definitely a lot of fun, and the food changes all the time, so you don't come out expecting. You can always have, you know, the regular breakfast burrito and the regular burger, but there's always going to be some little twist to it, especially with me and George on the Amigo. Uh, we're both chefs. So oh, we, yeah, I know George very well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, he yeah, should be yeah, here yeah. soon. So. Oh, really? Yeah, he's yeah, cooking literally. tonight. So um, oh, cool, cool. he got lucky he's on this trip, and then only because we got burned on. We were supposed to go out last weekend, but with the weather, they canceled both trips. So we were supposed to piggyback do an overnight and overnight. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, cancel that. So now yeah, we're on well, to this week and next week. So Yeah, you guys have definitely stepped it up, man. You, you, you know, they set the bar pretty high when it comes to the culinary types. Still. Definitely. On it's, all the boats. All the yeah, boats are picking yeah, it up. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's just normal to have a chef now. And it's kind of, I guess it's a trickle down, I guess. I mean, because I'm on, a, you know, the Miga. We only do two to two, two and a half days the most. But it's still a little more than just, you know, the... Uh, we're going on the uh, half day boat, you know, and oh, even yeah. the half day boats. I mean, you got boat burgers that are, you know, the most awesome. So it's trickling down to everything. Where unfortunately, everything everybody expects more. I think but, you have to, right? But hey, it's, I, it's that's fine with me. It's yeah. fine with me. I exactly. like it. I enjoy it. Exactly. That's awesome. All right, is that it? You want to get out of here? I'm chilling here, so I can oh, get cool. out. Or you want to go into the yeah, y'all questions? Yeah, we're getting yeah questions. Right. I mean, I'm yeah, sitting here. I'm like good. I'm not doing anything. I don't, I don't have to work, so I can laugh at these guys. All right, Hal says, howdy, guys. Hey, Danny, and, and you can ask Jason a question also. Hey, Danny, really like that T-shirt you have on. Uh, Q-Ball says, also named this Clinton <laughs> himself. Uh, David Alcantar, I am getting my gear ready for a 1.5-day trip, leaving tomorrow, hopefully targeting halibut and sea bass. I want a personal best sheephead. Should I bring surf clam and or shrimp. Shrimp works really good on sheep heads. Yeah, if you can bring shrimp, but they should have uh, frozen squid. You know, if there's not live squid, and you're going to get it on that either way. So, yeah. But you know, something that's been working also, Jason, I don't know if you see anybody doing it, but ghost shrimp, then you're fishing with a live shrimp, basically. Mm -hmm. And I've had some guys call me up and say, man, it's really killing the goat. So, we used to oh. fish those all the time back in the day when I was a kid. All the time. So, I only fished shrimp. them in the surf. I never fished them all. I used to on fish with my dad at the break wall. And yeah. we used to fish, um, we would buy, I know you were talking about crawdads. We used to buy crawdads and fish them. 
And my dad would actually yeah. grow crawdads, like in a old, um, you know, a tank, a water tank that you get out of an RV. Yeah, yeah. And we'd yeah. grow a bunch, and I, would, I always remember that. And I actually have a few crawdads in my house just because of that. <laughs> Listen, we, we, when we were seriously bass fishing, I would cure, I'd keep a hundred dozen cured at the house mm -hmm. and change the water every night. But we would go, we had a place, we took our anchovy crowders, right? Two guys, one on each end, one guy with a bait scoop. And we'd go along and you go through a, a section of the stream. And I, I'm not going to mention the stream, <laughs> but we would get them, throw them up on, on, the, uh, on the shore, pick out the choice ones, throw the little ones back and the big, the huge ones. We throw them back, but we take the two and three quarters. Yep, the perfect one you know that's going to get bit. For the bass fishing. Hey, I, when I go to Big Bear, every, anytime I go to Big Bear, I have crawdad traps I take and I put them out. And I take them to eat them. Are those those blue ones? The big um, blue there's, ones? I have a couple different ones that are round and I've made them myself too out of chicken wire. But I have the round one and then I have one that's like a square that I got from... Yeah, but, um, from you know the tackle shop. Yeah, but I'm I'm talking about the crawdad the species. Yeah, really the big blue ones. The no, they're not big and blue. The, the red, the, the red crab? Yeah, they're like the red ones. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, they okay. and you know they get pretty big. I've gotten yeah, some big yeah, ones yeah. where they're like almost a lobster, like this right, big. Right, right, right. But yeah, right. and you catch a couple, you know, catch a hundred of them or something in a two day trip, and it's, uh, you know, I fish for trout. So, but big bear's got a lot uh, bigger on bass fishing now. So I'm sure oh, no that's kidding. another. Oh yeah, it's a big deal now for ah. sure. Just like uh, the carp shootout, where they're shooting carp with the uh, bows Bull and, and arrows, everything. Yeah, yeah but uh, carp, um, bass fishing, carp, and even a bigger catfish are being caught now up there. Oh my god! It's crazy. It used to be a, you'd be lucky to catch one or two trout yeah, in a trip. Yeah, yeah. Now you catch a limit, and you can go target bass now. Wow! So. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Kim Herbert, who's going to be on our five-day trip, leaving Thursday on the Independence Crew up fishing the Daily Double in Daiwa. Lost many boat burgers <laughs> or fish on a hookup. You know what he's talking about, right? Oh, yeah. yeah I'm hooked up because you know you're going to get bit as soon as you... Hey, number 24, number two, as soon as you get called, you know it's like, oh, the bite's on or you're going to get bit. I've seen it happen with beers oh, over the side. Uh, you know, it's like... Or don't your crew members eat them and, like, they'll take a burger and eat it in two bites? Oh, yeah. Well, my crew we used to be able to do Well, that. luckily, we have a microwave. <laughs> so, you know what these jerks tell me? Oh, I'll make it for them. Just put it in the microwave. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, good stuff, Calico. Chris, hey, Chris, good to see you again. Muscles work great. Yeah, you have to have muscles to pull on the fish. <laughs> for right? sure, definitely. Oh, I think he's talking about the muscles, oh, the, uh, yeah. the bivalve or whatever it is. Alan yep, yep. Rushing, it seems ironic. We take lamb-based meat out to sea to enjoy, and then we catch seafood to enjoy when we get back on land. That's, the, right, right? that's the point, right? Surf and turf and turf yeah, and surf. Yep, yep. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's times now that every now and then, like especially as a galley guy, right, that um, you could take like a yellowtail. And, you know, you know, years ago down in Mexico, they wouldn't eat, a yellowtail, let's say, you know, like a ceviche, till it turned white, you know, yeah. right, with the lime. And now it's changed. You go down to Mexico, there's sushi bars over the place now. And I'm going to tell you, this is a recipe, folks. Get your pens and pencils out, all right? You take a yellowtail, cut it like sashimi, all right? Lay it all out. Squeeze lime on it. Okay, there's, I put a little tahini all over the top. Then I, uh, Use tapatio, and then you use some Kiko Man. You could use the light or the regular one, right? Mm -hmm. And then you dice, dice up cilantro, dice up red onions, throw it on top, and then on top of that, you throw. You could do serranos with or without the seeds. You know, I mean, if, you know, if you like it hot, keep the seeds on. But yeah. if not, the the, the flavor is, is is and it gives it just a little kick without mm -hmm. the seeds, right? And just serve it on tortilla chips killing it these days yeah and you know even in mexico now they're eating it raw they're not even waiting now once they squeeze it on we had it from our we learned this from one of our pongueros down in bay of la and so things have changed oh yeah definitely things have changed. i mean everything's fusion now oh, so that's exactly. exactly what you're talking there all those exactly. ingredients are fusion between asian and you know doing anything oh, from yeah. ceviche to poke to you know it's you got all it. mixed up you know you got it that's you're using part, sriracha right? like come on you know oh yeah <laughs> having, you know you're mixing it up so that's the fun part about yep. it too yeah yeah have you tried your own fusion have you come up with anything novel 
I never come up with anything novel. Just when I try to think of something to make, I'll usually go online and look up 10 recipes or however many recipes for that thing and then take all the best things I like out of those well, and you make go. it. So That's like, it. you know, Let's make it like, oh, I want to make poke, you know, so yeah, I'll look up, you know, sure. and depending, you know, it changes. And then you know what Absolutely. you're, like, I know what my flavor profile is and I, you know, I've been cooking long enough where it's like, I just need to look at the ingredients Exactly. And I can figure out how much I want to put of each. Yeah. Because you know? I know, oh, you, like you said, oh, how spicy do I want it? You know, like I'm smart enough. Hey, taste the chili because sometimes, it, like we all know with jalapenos, sometimes they're not spicy at all. Yeah. And sometimes they're as spicy as a serrano. Yeah, right. So, yeah. you know, yeah. that's where, you know, tasting and knowing it's like, oh, you cook by feel as opposed yeah. to, oh, I got to measure every single thing. So, I mean, I, you know, I'd probably come up with a couple good things, but nothing of major I could say, oh, yeah. I that, invented that's, this cool dish. That's a fun, that's a fun part, though, right? I yep, mean, yeah. is mixing all the stuff yeah, up. You exactly, know? exactly. Hal wants to know, what's your favorite fish to eat? Let's start with Jason, and then we'll go to Danny. Jason. Yellowtail is mine, but I love white sea. Yellowtail, because I eat it all the time. i able to have it as sushi. I always love My favorite, if I get sushi or sashimi, is uh, yellowtail belly. But um, cooking, I do, we had some halibut, so I love halibut, but, you know, that's a, kind of a bland fish. But uh, I'd say yellowtail probably, but I'll take a white sea bass all day. You know, <laughs> I, I love it all, but you know, we've been spoiled. Like, to me, Boqueta, the grouper that come out of the deep water, mm -hmm. is my number one. Two would be a Cabrillo. Yep. I mean, you know, when the grouper, but I mean, just the flavor in the meat. And I mean, that's... That's one of the reasons why we go down to Bay of L.A. Exactly. That's you know? where a lot of guys up here, when they can't, when they don't get down that far, they, we, we barely yeah. started even tapping into I remember going on day and a half down to Colinette. Yeah. We didn't even worry about groupers. Who cared? Yeah. Now people are slow pitching and doing that stuff. So now we're starting to catch and keep those things. But what's the grouper we all knew? Oh, black sea bass. Or, you know, that's what we, you yeah. know, oh, we yeah. can't keep it, you know. Yeah. Where now you're seeing a lot more people catch, you know, what, broomtail groupers yep. and all that yep. kind of stuff. And, come, yeah. You know, and you're talking about, like, meat, like how we're thinking of a white sea bass where it's thick and, you know, it's, it's like catching big it's fish. And it's got the flavor. It's just got, it's unbelievable, the texture, the flavor. Yeah. Yep, it, uh, and it's not overly fishy or anything. Oh, we got another fish coming in. Oh, Whoa! Whoa! Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, uh -oh. Yeah. oh, he had baby. Oh, you better get the... the fish on the camera. Oh, oh no. Oh. They're poor fish. Oh, no. For God's sakes, Michael, show that to the... Forget those guys. Show it to the camera. <laughs> to the camera. Michael. <laughs> Over here, Michael. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, you better... let, 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 Please let that fish go now. Better get the babies <laughs> back in the Thank water. You, Michael, Catch and release. Good job, Michael. That's three now. So we... Oh, no, we can't the, hey, there's a the small baby has too. one, too. Oh, hey. We count that. <laughs> <laughs> I count that as four. Yeah, okay, he's up to four. That's true. Hey, there's no pictures on the scorecard, right? Right. <laughs> tally, that's what Fishing Game wants, a tally. That's right. Alan Rushing says, hey, Danny, that sounds absolutely so tasty. You know, that's the fun part of it, too. That's the reward at the end of the trip, you know. And oftentimes, like I said, we get that out of the galley guys, you know. And, you know, once, once these guys, so they, they throw a party at the house and they do something like that, Man, all it is is you'll get the wives going, hey, you need to go fishing again. We need some more yellowtail. We need more of this. We yep. Need... How, and good, it's so easy how good does too. that get? Right? It's so easy. Like you said, all you got to do is worry about slicing it. The rest yeah. of it is chop, chop stuff you throw together. Exactly. So, you know, like, like an example, go to a sushi place and get their carpaccio or their poke where it's a little couple slices, and those are all the different flavors they put on it. One place I go, they put, it's like uh, pico de gallo on tuna. It's almost that. The other one has a bunch of other stuff, and that's almost how you, you know, you can combine all your flavors, and it's such a simple thing. Yeah, yeah. Jason, I've got fun. a question for you. Yes. Can you tell the difference when you make a dish between fresh pork caught fish and a fish you buy at Albertsons? Yeah, um, I would the say quality. Is it definitely you can tell the quality because what you catch out here is definitely you're going to eat it within three or four days of catching it. And it's going to be a firm fish, especially if it's taken care of, which yeah. most of the boats are taking care of all the fish. Oh, yeah. I mean, all the boats have RSWs now. Yep. I mean, yep. and if they don't and there's a problem, they're bringing ice on to take care of your fish. Right. So you can definitely tell because we're all out there. Unless you're going on a trip that's five days or more when it's sitting in there on ice. I mean, it, you're having it within a couple of days of catching it. So you can definitely tell. Whereas, So I would say you could tell the fish is a little more firmer. And you could tell. Whereas if something you get, say, from the market that's, you know, it's been shipped from the boat to the market or to the purveyor, to the market, to you, you're talking another five days, which doesn't mean it's bad, but that's where you have to pay attention to 
um, the fish a little bit more because who knows if that fish that you're grabbing yeah. out of the same batch was caught three days earlier and put on ice yeah. and by that time. So, you know, there's things to look at. They look at the eyes, see if they're cloudy or clear. You know, look at the gills and see if they're still red or not. Mm -hmm. There's ways to look, and that's what I do when I go to buy fish um, for the restaurant or you know, when I worked at restaurants. That's what the things you look for. So you don't want to go in there where it has a real white eye. It looks like it's been frozen three times. Right. You can tell. Press right. on the skin. If it go comes back, then you can tell. So I would say when you're catching them out here, it's a lot fresher, and you can tell definitely off of those things. And you can pay attention and see and look for that if you're going to buy a fish from a market. And, you know, the, the kids on the boat now, and the captains, the crews, the way the level of the, the way they take care of the fish now, the way it's bled, you know, it's spiked. There's, there's, there's so much more than it was when we, when we started fishing. It would sit in a gunny sack all day, and it was still, we still thought it was fresh. Yep. But now, it gets bled, spiked, put down in the fish. I mean, it's high quality. Yep. That's what quality. the problem is with fish That's that back in the day we had, like Barracuda exactly. and Bonita. They still have that stigma of being a shitty fish because, yes, they sat, sat on the, the deck in, a, gunny in a brown gunny sack you know, all day. Whereas now you take a barracuda, bleed it out. Yeah, you know, they're a little slimy, but you want to know something funny? A halibut is super slimy too. Try to fillet that. That's right. They're just as slimy. Exactly. So don't tell me that. It's a matter of how you take care of the fish. So exactly. Bonita, you know, you always hear, oh, it's sashimi. And people that know what's oh, yeah. up, they'll make it into poke, oh, yeah. Yeah. sashimi, or ceviche. And, you know, exactly. it's more about the texture of the fish than it being how old it is now, like those kind of things. Sure. They still have a bad rap, but I've done it before where I'll be like, oh, here's some fish, put butter and garlic on it, salt and pepper, here you go, eat it. Hey, that was barracuda. No, it wasn't. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yep. Alan says, man, when I was growing up, my mom was Japanese. Sashimi was baked to my friends. Now my boys were the envy of school when we brought sushi, uh, sashimi, to our boys in grade school. Really different times now. When I was a little kid, I couldn't eat sashimi. <laughs> you know, it really, it really was just... <laughs> my grandparents ate fish all the time, you know, and that's probably why they lived so long, you know. But my dad, And, at you know, when my brother and we started working on boats, then we started eating more and more fish. And then, you know, we were spoiled because we had... We, we processed it ourselves, and, you know, and, and we, you know, we took care of it. But it, it changed. And you look now, it's all mainstream. My God. Yep. You know. It is an acquired taste, just like anything else, yeah. you know. So yeah. once you acquire that taste for it, and hey, different fish are different fish. Like me, even now, I can eat a lot of sashimi, but don't, like, you go and you get mackerel. I can't do a mackerel. I don't care what you do to it. <laughs> I just know that I don't, know what, it, I don't, yeah. I don't know what it is. And, and you want to know something? That old saba, you know, is a big standard, you know, in the sushi bar. I haven't eaten it yet. I can't. I can't I don't do know it. what it is. It's kind of, it, well, it's, it is a little fishy. I can eat a so. Spanish, a cooked Spanish mackerel is excellent, but I've never had that raw either. Yep. You know? well, just, just funny about, in my Taste, head. yeah. Well, I'm kind of weird that too. That was my bait. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the way I think about it. Well, I'm kind of weird too. I really, I can't stand salmon, like when it's cooked. Like, it's too omega-3 for me, kind of like a trout, you know? Yeah. i got to put a bunch of flavors to it. Yeah. But I can do it raw, I can get through it. Or if it's smoked, I can do it for sure on grab oh, locks, yeah. for yeah. sure. Yeah. But yeah. if I have it cooked and it's cooked all the <laughs> way through, no way. Unless it's very high quality. Like, if you catch, a, you know, something. Yeah. You get you know, them out of Alaska. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's a little it's bit different, different than farm-raised, you know? Yep. And what would the Danny Cadona show be without another cryptic message <laughs> from Steve Bermudez? <laughs> Any changes to the dogger dog for the player Otomni? Uh, I haven't seen any. I watched the game today and they won. Um, oh, cool. They, get, they won today? Yeah, they won today. Seven to one. So um, they could put, um, you know, some rice seasoning on top of it or something. I don't know. What, <laughs> how how I mean, could you make it? Come on, uh, you're in L.A. You can get away with putting it in a sushi bar up there. You know, oh, heck yeah. I got dodger dogs in my freezer, exactly. actually. Yeah. All right, Alan says fish should never smell fishy. Well cared for fish has not odor um, uh, and uh, uh, will taste great. That's not true. Go to Japan and go to any real sushi person and uh, fish, they don't use fish fresh. They actually age it a little. And it should not smell fishy what we think is bad, but it should have a little bit of smell. If it has no smell, then it's either too fresh to eat 
or it's not really good consumption to eat. I see the dry aging. I've seen that too, but I know yeah. from it that yeah. I would I, like I would not eat a fish that smells fishy to me. Like you know, we yeah. think of fishy as bait smell, right. but certain fish, you, they, it's supposed to taste like some, or it's supposed to smell like something. Like it shouldn't smell like nothing. Otherwise, it's been treated or soaked in water or. And if you if you ever watch sushi chefs, like here in California, yeah, we slice it. But you know, if you go to a real sushi place, they brine them. They'll put them in rice vinegar and salt for thirty minutes before they do it. So there should be some flavor to the fish. Oh, there you go. Well, see, maybe I'm. It's it's brought out of me, man. We got here in eighteen ninety. Our family got here in eighteen ninety two, and so being a third, you know, third generation, yeah. The real fishy stuff turns me off. I me know. too. I I'm feel too, the same I'm way. Too, I'm too old school, <laughs> man. I, you know. Oh. Well, David Alcantar is going to tell you two guys off. He says he grew up eating a lot of mackerel. No wonder I can eat pretty much most fish and find it tasty. <laughs> hey, you know what's good? Have you ever had canned mackerel? Yes. It's pretty good. Yeah, canned I've had it. If, if, if it's smoked too, definitely. You know, like. Like I could do it, like sardines. I could do smoked, but not just salted. No way. Yeah. Or yeah. you guys do well, lutefisk. I like Spanish do mackerel. What? Lutefisk. No. Oh, no. that's like where it's soaked in lye. It's um like cod or some. You know, it's from oh. uh you know like Ireland or something or uh, Scandinavia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, oh my God! It's like it's lutefisk. Ugh. Oh, it, what is, is it ludicrous? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty I much. Mean, no, it tastes like lye. <laughs> like, uh, um, I have I've had it a couple times, but really the worst thing I've ever had in my life I had was that I let uh, the Greenland shark when oh, they oh yeah those ugly things yeah and they uh, mm. ferment them for six months and trim it all off because they have um, <laughs> antifreeze in their blood that is poisonous, but it tastes like ammonia and of course you're supposed to eat it and you're supposed to have like a shot of their because you got to have a shot to get it down. But, oh, my God, it was the worst thing I ever had. But I had to try it. I had to try it. It was like the worst piece of cheese you've ever had. You ever had, like, really stinky cheese? <laughs> I can't do that either. You know, I, I don't know worst. what it is, man. I'm <laughs> the worst. Oh. <laughs> That's funny. Jack Sepulveda <laughs> sent me over some canned eels. I ate them on the show the other day. Have you guys ever had canned eels? No, yeah, I've never well, had canned they eels. They were bad. They were okay. U unagi, Japanese unagi, yeah. I do like. Yes, I like that I too. I do like, yeah. Um, yeah. All right, Dan Smith says, David Alcantar, I grew up the same way. My mother is full Sicilian. We ate everything from the ocean. I'm still here. It's all good. Hey, if you're oh, eating yeah. all the food from Sicily and over there, I would eat all that too and yeah. boil it in yeah. their salt yeah. water. You know, you're talking. Oh, absolutely. My, my, you know, Gail, my wife, um, her family came from Ischia, which is an island. And a lot of San Pedro people are, you know, the Italians here are from Ischia, you know, and it, it's, it's funny because it's, it's almost the same distance from Naples. You know, San Pedro is almost the same distance. From Naples to Isca, and Isca would be the same distance as Catalina. Mm -hmm. And it's almost the same size island, everything, you know. So I think that's why so many Iscatans settled in San Pedro, you know. But, you know, it's funny how that. And works. it was such and a so fishing all, village at oh, that time, yeah, too, the way fishing, Pedro is, yeah. you know. So. And a lot of them came here because they were, a lot of the, those people worked on fishing boats here in San Pedro. Yep, exactly. Yeah. People don't realize how big of an industry it was before even the, you know, the Navy came in in the 50s and the 40s. How much it was fishing, and you look at the pictures from even the tuna club in Avalon, where they're catching you yeah. know, three, four hundred yeah. pound tuna, and all the crazy stuff you see. It's such a difference from what it is now, from when they put in the harbor and everything. Oh, yeah, like, I, I remember. I guess before the war, my uncles, a bunch of my uncles, worked on bait boats, you know, here in San Diego. So you know, it was yeah, maybe that's where we got some of that blood. Yep. Know? Yeah, but. All right, good stuff. Dan amazing. Smith, I uh, wondered whether he was on the carnivore diet still. He says, I'm still doing the carnivore diet. It's tough, but if I have carbs, his wife Kim will beat him up with an aluminum fish billy club. She's <laughs> really mean. <laughs> Hey, wait a second. Is there? Right back, Kim. Is there? He's not mean. Wait, is there a club? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> uh, no, I don't believe that. Kim is a lovely person, no question about it. As long as they're not on the boat and she closes him and he falls over the side, that's. Uh... Hey, Jason, why don't you give everybody out there an idea of how much sleep you get when you're a galley cook? And Danny said it's one of the toughest jobs oh. around. What What is a day like as a galley cook? Why don't you take us from morning? 
tonight when you get back in. All right, well, we'll start off like we're leaving tonight. So tonight we go out. Um, I would have got here right around now, a couple hours before the trip leaves. So like right now they're leaving at 9 o'clock, so I'd be here usually around 7. Uh, load up the boat, make sure I have all your sodas and waters and all that kind of stuff. Do you shop? Um, I did shop a lot last year. I yeah, probably I shop a little say, bit this year, too, just because yeah, I enjoy that's it. Say, that's, but it's work. It's a lot of, you know. Yeah, you know, definitely. So that's yeah. even pre-hand is going to shop for my stuff. So I get down here, load it all up. And then me, personally, I love to fish. So I treat myself as a deckhand as well as a, as a cook. So I'm out helping, you know, either bring bait on or tie up rigs. We always laugh. I'll have everybody tied up by the time they have bait on. So I'm doing that kind of stuff. And I'll usually stay up, you know, 11, 12 o'clock, getting breakfast together for the next morning, you know, cooking potatoes, getting all the prep done. Um, and then it's, you know, get a little bit of sleep. I'm usually up by 5 o'clock or earlier, you know, starting potatoes and getting that kind of, The earlier the sun comes up, the earlier I got to get up. So, you know, what's that? Four or five hours of sleep if I'm lucky. That's trying to watch a movie. And, the you know, last year was a crazy trip. You know, every trip was wild, so you're rocking. So luckily, you can get a couple hours of sleep. So you're up cooking, and then I don't take naps, so I'm up there cooking breakfast. I'm out there fishing with everybody, acting like a deckhand if we're in a bite. Sometimes I'm out yeah. on the bait yeah. tank flinging, you know, chumming. I have a good time with it all, so I do that all the way throughout the day. And I hate to say it, but I'm getting tired of this nighttime tuna fishing because it keeps me it's, up even later. It's brutal. It's brutal because you oh. don't want to go to bed. I mean, I had times last season... Where I was in my bunk and I heard fish hit the deck that I knew were big as hell. And I was just like, I can't roll out of bed. I got to wake up at, you know, 5.30 in the morning, 5 in the morning to start cooking again. And yeah. I was just and like, And then ah. they bite during the day. Yeah. The, the nerve. Yeah, huh? the nerve of them. The <laughs> nerve of them. And then, of course, the nighttime bite has always been bigger fish, too. Oh, yeah. So it's yeah. like, yeah. it's, you know, a roller coaster. And then that's not even getting into when we're doing trips that are a day and a half or we're doing dinner, too. Right. So I'm not even done with dinner until 10 o'clock, depending on the fishing. If it gets dark at 8 o'clock, if we're catching, you know, you're always uh, changing it to what time. So it's a big flow of figuring out what the people want to do and how the fishing goes. It's never like we're going to have breakfast from 6 to 8 and we're going to have lunch from noon to 2 and we're going to have dinner from, you know, 6 to 8. No, it changes throughout. It, it's a big, uh, and it depends on the people, you know. Some people want to eat a bunch, some people don't. You know, so, and I play it all by ear yeah. myself, you know. It is. People, you got to appreciate all these guys that are in the game. Let me tell you, it is. the. This is a captain talking. Probably the toughest job on the boat as far as I'm concerned, you know. Uh, it is very difficult. And, uh, you know, it's funny because even, like, when we used to hit uh, San Diego in the summertime, we had the, my brother, the Cherokee, would be at H&M. And then I'd have the, I had the fortune of the Mustang over at Islandia. So I, my sister was out of college at the time. I mean, not out, but she was on break. She did all the shopping. So she would have to supply all three boats. You know, and I'm thinking, okay, that's great. You know, I forgot what we were paying her, but it was uh, at the end of the year when I had to go do the shopping for the three boats, I'm going, oh, my God, we didn't pay her enough. Yeah. There's a lot of stinking work. Yeah, a lot of weight. The carts, Yeah. And back then, all the sodas were coming on, and beer, everything was carted on every day. Yep. You know, it wasn't the dispensers that, it, you know, uh, soda dispensers that they have now on a lot of the boats and yep. everything else. And so, you know, it's a tremendous amount of work, you know. So you got to, you know, tip your head and take it's care of It's a lot of, of pre-work and a lot of, of after work that people Absolutely. don't realize. I mean, yeah. even on the deckhand side, too, from cleanup when they get here to when you leave oh. and we have to clean everything. And, you know, we wash everything twice because we wash it all in salt water the first time. And then we get back to the dock and we wash it all in fresh water. And just people don't realize all that work we put into it for you to have a great time, you know, and, have, and us to have a smile on our face the whole time. Yeah. On two oh, hours absolutely. of sleep. Just as an example, on our crew trip, two of our crew members, three of our crew members were out there all night till six in the morning making all that squid for us. And they stayed up and took a nap and still fished a little, but they're the ones that made the trip for us because we wouldn't have had any bait. There you go, folks. Make sure you take care of the crew. Yep. You don't realize. Absolutely you may go to bed, not, yeah. and you don't realize what happens in between yeah. there. Because I went to bed at 10, and I woke up. I knew what they were doing. I woke up, holy shit, there's a half a tank of squid in here. What the hell? Did they come and float? No, we pulled them two or three at a time. What? You guys are crazy. Yeah. You know, like... Oh, well, and then you talk about, you know, especially now with the tuna bite all... All day, all night, you know, taking night watches and stuff. I mean, it's 
It's brutal. Big time. It's brutal. And especially these, the bluefin biting around the clock now. You know, there's no... No well, even for the fishermen, it. think about it, and the crew, oh, yeah. we're driving yeah. around at night looking for fish when people want to sleep and stuff, and you're rocking. You, how do you even fall asleep at that? you got to get used to it. Like, I, I get used to it eventually. I know. But imagine somebody that's not on the boat, and they're rocking and rolling until 2 in the morning because we're driving in circles for tuna, and then you got to wake up the next morning and do it all again like your normal fly lining for tuna. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> After yeah. doing this all night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a lot of work. Oh, that's man. It's a lot of work. You know... And Danny, you're right about that being such a tough job, but that is one of the few things on a boat that you can control. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't control the fish bite, oh, yeah. can't True. control the weather, but the people that walk in that galley, man, mm -hmm. you can control that food. And if you put out a quality product, even on a slow trip, people are going to say, man, that Jason Lawler, not only is one hell of a nice guy, but God darn, that was good. Yep, definitely. It makes exactly. a big difference. On exactly. having good food. Exactly. And I think that's why it's trickled down because even when it's a little slower, if you have decent food and you're having a good time and the crew's having fun, it's still... Because everybody... Come on. If you're a seasoned fisherman, you know it's not catching. It's not you're catching. not going to kill them every time. <laughs> it's, it's not, not going to kill Yeah, it's time. fishing, yeah. not catching. That's right. You know, and you live for that trip where you catch a million of them, but it, what, that's one in ten? You know, like, hooray. And when you have good food and good service and, you know, quality... Um, accommodations, all that kind of stuff yeah, that goes along with the boat. Absolutely. That makes such a big difference absolutely. on morale of the crew and everybody, to tell you the truth. That's true. That's so Jason, true. why don't you tell us a little bit about the Amigo, the boat that you work on, uh, the crew on there. You got Mark Paisano, you got Mark Sonov. I don't know who else is on there. Yes, yeah, Sonoda's on there. Um, so we have um, a couple new guys coming to the boat. Um, I could tell you now, I mean, we've talked about it. He was on the last trip. Um, our backup captain now is uh, Tino, so Tino's going to be backing up. Tino uh, is? Yeah, he's going to be the relief captain for uh, oh, Marky, God. so that's cool to have him on the boat. Yes. We all know he's very fishy, and we had a good time oh, with yeah. him yeah. Um, on our crew trip, so he'll be backing him up. Um, we still have Nick as our, um, our night um, captain. Um, Sonoda, I know Mark Sonoda, he just uh, got his captain's license, so hopefully pretty soon once he gets all his paperwork, he'll be doing night captaining. Um, but all both those guys, um, as well as uh, Johnny, I call him Young Blood. He'll be our other deckhand, and then we have a couple of backup guys, and then we have Red um, that's going to be out with us, who's out here all the time, and he does a lot of commercial fishing uh, for lobster. Um, so it's going to be a great crew doing that. Um, we've all worked together a few years. Well, we did last year. I'm going to do another year just because we had such a good time. Oh, but we have nice. a very good crew. That's very. Um, we're all good friends, and it shows. And as soon as somebody walks on the boat, you'll see we're always having a good time and messing around. And Hey, that's what it's all about, man. And Go just Mark Sonoda, he's so loud, you can't miss it. He's as loud <laughs> as me, so you get me and him on the boat, and it's... Uh... He's like that character, Baboom. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that... All right, boys, you want to wrap this up? Or yeah, else? sure. No, sure. I mean, that was great. Yeah. Go ahead, wrap her up, you two. Well, I want to explain this, and this is really... I... I, I I think it's one of the few times I've worn this shirt, but I've been very blessed. I've never had to pull it out because my wife has never, ever denied me a fishing trip or anything. I just wore it because there was something different. And <laughs> anyway, <laughs> not reflection of you, Gil, <laughs> if you're watching. You don't have to change the keys on the house before I get home. <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Definitely. Thank and you so much. I'm show. glad to be on the show. It's been a long time since I've been here. That's it's awesome. Been way too long. Hey, way too long. That's awesome. We've been friends for a long Well, not a long time, but it seems like we're like Yeah, right? Friends. It's been a couple years at least. I mean, yeah. geez. So. We hit it off from the, the time. Uh, David Alcantar says, I'll see the Amigo crew next week on one of Damien's charters. See you soon, guys. Perfect. I won't be on that one, but George will be on that one. I'd like to fish it, maybe. I might be on there fishing. We'll see. <laughs> but I have the next two trips after that. So Awesome. i, I got to make one final comment. You talk about how hard it is and the hours, and you get a freaking day off, and guess what you do? You go jump back on the boat and go fishing. Yep, but or fish it. You love it. Yeah, or fish on my private boat. My private boat's in the water right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all about. Yep, it's like your day off, you go back on the water. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> Tangle Diver says, Happy Easter. Oh, yeah. Happy all. Easter, folks. Right? Yeah, Happy absolutely. Easter because it's coming up. Yeah. Yeah, we're moving yes. up on, yeah, on Sunday. Yeah. Steve Duncan says, Wow, that's good to hear Mark got his ticket. I worked for him years back in the day. I've cooked on the boats also. Yep. Steve Duncan, good man. 
All right, everybody. All right, it's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in, folks. See you next week.